Well, hello everybody. 11.15 a.m. Pacific Time on Thursday, August 18th. The Ask Me Anything begins once again. So thanks everybody in the Lynchpin private Facebook group as well as the Lynchpin squad on the BTWB app for all the questions. Good ones rolled in. We'll dive into the top few. We'll do some shout outs and we'll just have a great day. It's a rest day. It's a fantastic day. Uh, let's see. Oh, I just saw greetings from Venezuela. Man, I know Venezuela historically has some stuff going on, right? We won't talk politics or any of that other stuff, but I always wanted to go to Venezuela and I never got my opportunity. It was always really high on my list. I've been to a whole bunch of places in, in South America, but Venezuela always eluded me, so maybe one day. That was a tangent. Sorry. Okay. Let's go ahead and dive right in. First most upvoted question is from a gentleman by the name of Patrick S. He gets a lot of questions answered on the AMA. People like his questions and they upvote him. Not Again, Patrick S. is not me. It's a different Patrick S. So here's what his question was. <clears throat> I like doing low ring muscle-ups, but is there any benefit in doing them if you don't have pull-ups or ring dips yet? Would it be more beneficial to do ring rows or bench dips, especially if you don't have a bar dip or both, etc., when they come up? Great question. So there's a couple things we'll piece together here. Benefits of ring rows in general. Um, whether you and then whether you do or don't have pull-ups or ring dips yet, should you be doing them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know they're all kind of leading towards that wonderful and sometimes elusive real ring muscle up on the high rings. But we get you covered. So let's dive in. Long story short, you don't have ring muscle ups yet. You don't have pull-ups yet. You don't have ring dips yet. Is there benefit to low ring muscle ups? Short answer, yes. I won't beat around the bush, yes. And why? It's because something we've said many times, and we'll say it again, variance is a wonderful thing. A wonderful thing. And intelligent variance can help you achieve your goals quicker. And low ring muscle-ups can be worked into that equation, even if you don't have pull-ups or dips yet. With that being said, if that person who aspires to have the ring muscle up one day, does not yet have pull-ups of the strict variety, I might say, and does not have ring dips yet, also of the strict variety, then those things should absolutely be getting attention and reps to build towards them. So it's not like just, ah, I don't have pull-ups, I don't have dips, I'm just gonna continue to do these other things forever. No, be working on the strict pull-ups, be working on the strict dips. That hopefully goes, you know, without saying. And the low ring muscle ups, getting back to the original question as to why they're a yes and they can be worked in intelligently is because variance is a great thing. So it's not like if you don't have pull-ups that you should just be trying one thing to get a pull-up. You're going to do it with some great variance because it's very effective. So maybe if you don't have pull-ups yet, you're going to do banded pull-ups, you know, ideally with just enough band that makes it challenging, not so much of a band that you're not really doing any work. But you're going to do banded pull-ups, seated pull-ups, you know, with a low barbell in a squat rack or something like that. You're going to do ring rows, bent over rows. You're going to do static holds, you know, maybe in that ring row position or in that seated pull-up position with your chin over the bar at the top. Just do a static hold or with the rings rowed to your chest in what's a challenging angle for your body do a static hold. Those are all going to have benefits as well, varying the angles. Negatives. Yes, negatives are absolutely fantastic. They have to be done intelligently. If you're unfamiliar with rhabdo, rhabdomyolysis, you can do some internet searching, so we'll cross the journal articles, but if you've built up a tolerance and if you can, you know, you're ready for it, negatives are a fantastic protocol to also help you achieve your goal as well. So negatives could be done on all of those things that I just said a second ago. Negatives on the bar with a band that allows you to get to the top, and you do a slow on the way down. 
Um, same with the seated rows, same with the ring rows, all those other kind of good stuff right there. If you are not familiar with it, BTWB has some fantastic programs. They've got a program to help you get your first strict pull-up. So all you need to do is go to the home screen in the BTWB app, go to the three lines in the upper left-hand part of the screen, tap that, and then on that drop-down menu, one of the options will say programs. Tap on that, and there's like 15 to different 20, 15 or 20 different programs that you can check out, and they're amazing. And one of them is how to get your first strict pull-up, so definitely check that out. While talking about things that we would like to develop en route to the muscle-up, I'd love to see a strict chest bar pull-up as well. That would be really helpful because eventually getting yourself that ring muscle-up is not just a big pull, like a pull-up, but it's a really deep pull, more similar to a chest bar pull-up, and then the ring dip that's going to follow. If you've been short-changing the range of motion on your dips, that's not going to serve you well on the ring muscle-up as well, because once you finally find yourself up in the rings in a, the bottom of a dip, it will most likely be in the bottom of a very, very deep ring dip. So you want to have been strengthening that position from the get-go so it doesn't catch you unawares when you actually need it. And so, same thing that we would say with, you know, because Patrick's question is, this is somebody who doesn't have pull-ups and doesn't have ring dips yet. Same with the ring dips. We're going to improve it through intelligent variants, right? We're going to improve pressing strength in general. Um, pressing strength, shoulders, chest, triceps, upper back. We can do it through pull-ups, strict shoulder press, push press, push jerk, handstand holds, the around the box walks that we do in place of handstand walks. Even though that's not an overhead press, you are just strengthening your chest, shoulders, triceps, and midline in that position. All are things which are going to be helpful with the ring dip as well. Again, variants bench dips, box dips with your feet on the ground, as much or as little assistance as is needed, bar dips with just enough band, like we said with the pull-ups, to make them really hard. If you've built up the tolerance to it, the negatives can be worked in there as well. You can put the band on the rings. I mean, there's 10 different ways that you can be attacking trying to get one movement, the ring dip, and doing all of those is going to be more beneficial than just doing one or two, right? So this all works us back to our original question, which is the lowering muscle up. Even if you don't have the pull up or even if you don't have the dip yet, what the lowering muscle up is, it's just another way to attack those goals that you're working towards. It's a wonderful pull and a wonderful push. And that's what pull ups and you know dips are. And the lowering muscle up is gonna help strengthen exactly the musculature that's required to get yourself a muscle up one day. And it will hit everything in just a slightly different way than everything that was mentioned previously. It ties the two together, that pull and the push really well, and it has that transition aspect in the middle. And it's complicated, and that's a good thing. There's a lot of mental engagement needed so that your central nervous system actually fires everything in the right sequence. That is fantastic as well. So working in those lowering muscle-ups in addition to everything else is going to be your friend, and there's huge benefit in doing that. And another great thing about the lowering muscle-up, which is right in line with everything else that we said, is it is infinitely scalable because you're going to have your feet down there on the ground, and so it really is up to you. You can use very little feet, and you will make huge strength gains with a lowering muscle because you're darn near doing a strict, uh, strict muscle up, which is no joke. If you're not there yet, which most people aren't, that's fine. Use as much leg as you need to, to accomplish the repetition, but just barely enough so that it's not so much a lower body movement as you're really placing the demand on the upper body. And then What's also great about them is as you fatigue during the workout, you can gradually modulate that to using a little bit more leg as the upper body becomes a little bit more fatigued. And so they're just a fantastic way to get a great push-pull, pull-push into a workout and build towards what you want to have um, in the long run as well. You can also use a band on them. There's a great ways to do that as well. Now, for example, 
I the other day that we did Amanda, right? The named CrossFit workout for Amanda Miller. There's ring muscle-ups in that. In my garage, we have a set of higher high rings and a set of low rings. The high rings my wife can do ring muscle-ups on. They're just there's just enough clearance for her. I can't do high ring muscle-ups in my garage, so I always do the low ring. I'm not the world's tallest guy, but there's just not enough clearance for me. And I can do low ring muscle-ups, you know, and, and I can put my feet up on a box and make them like really challenging. They're great. But the other day, before I even knew this question was going to get posted, I did something a little bit different just because if we could follow the bouncing ball, like I'm not just saying it because it's a nice answer on Instagram. It really is true. Variance is a wonderful thing. So even though I've done a ton of lowering muscle-ups and I can do regular prescribed lowering muscle-ups and they're plenty hard, the other day during Amanda for just giggles, I said, you know what? I'm just going to do a little something different today because variance is beneficial. So I really pushed the pace and I actually used a lot of leg on my lowering muscle-ups, even though, again, I've got the upper body strength to do them so I don't need it but here's how I did it. Used a lot of leg, got myself up to that top of the dip position, and then from there, I had my like just my heel on the ground with my legs straight. I did as slow of a negative back down to the bottom of the dip and then the bottom of the hang with the rings fully extended as I could absolutely tolerate. It was excruciating and wonderful all at the same time. And it was so darn taxing that I wouldn't be able to pull up again to the top of a ring muscle up. So I used a lot of leg to help assist me get to the top. And then I did as slow of a negative as I could absolutely tolerate. And that's what I did for 975 for my version of Amanda. Now that's not what I would recommend somebody does on week one of CrossFit that hasn't built up a tolerance to the eccentric phase of the movement and all that kind of stuff and negatives. But if you have there's some great stuff out there to play with, even with a movement that you've done countless times. And so variance is your friend. Uh, let's see. Oh, and beyond the whiteboard, there are other programs that they have. If you're still working towards these skills, they've got your first pull up, first muscle up and first ring dip. So you can get you all, all those things. And also on the CrossFit Lynchpin YouTube channel, what the heck's the name of the playlist? It's not workouts. Maybe it's like instructional videos or something like that. But if you go to whatever playlist seems like it would be instructional content, there's two different videos on low ring muscle ups if you're kind of, if you want to learn more about them and how to work them into your training. So good question. All right. Next most upvoted one is from Scott F. Pardon me for one second while I enjoy some water. All right. Here's what Scott asks. Do you ever program training workouts, not competitions, with a mental stimulus in mind? A couple of times in the recent Very Not Random podcast, those two guys are untrustworthy. Don't listen to the people in that podcast. A couple of times in the recent Very Not Random podcast, you highlighted aspects of the games workouts that forced competitors to do a gut check and lean on their mental toughness. I'm curious what your considerations are for, you know, trap workouts, so to speak. This is an interesting question. I'm glad it got upvoted. I've got a lot of thoughts on this, and I don't know if they'll be coherent, but we'll just dive right in. So, you know, mental, t- here's a bunch of things wrapped into this, right? Mental toughness being the underlying one, and, you know, do you programming for it, and et cetera, et cetera, and then competition versus everyday garage gym athlete just working on their own and you know can you program a workout for mental toughness and how does that work in so first of all competition versus everyday training it can be almost i shouldn't say easier but it's more obvious you see this push or this mental toughness aspect come out in competitions and that's largely because the big difference between that and what happens when you and I work out uh, in our garage is we don't have 35 high definition cameras streaming what we do to the world to see. And so, you know, that's what we get to see. That's what we get to watch. And so you notice the push and this is amazing. This happened in competition. Look at that mental toughness. You don't see that on the everyday garage gym goer because they don't have, you know, a CBS sports team following them around. 
but that doesn't mean that it's not there, and not just as potent or relevant. I'm already getting distracted. So in competition, when you see this mental toughness, you see an athlete dig deep, you know, and it's just so obvious and apparent. Well, that can be for many, many reasons. I mean, the stakes are high in competition because people have decided that it's important. Uh, and you see people pushing the envelope in crazy ways, riding the razor's edge, enduring far more pain than they may otherwise choose to. And that could be because a crazy time cap, like a really aggressive time cap was given in the workout and it's do or die. Maybe they find themselves in a very tight points race with another competitor and they're both racing for the podium in the, in the lane next to them and that forces them to go someplace they've never been on some you know, pain tolerance or pacing. Maybe they really want $300,000, know, the grand prize of the games. Maybe that sounds like a, a nice thing to go home with and so they're willing to really go into the hurt locker and show some mental toughness because 0.3 of $1 million sounds like a cool thing to have. Or maybe they had a plan and the person in the other lane suddenly pulled ahead and now that messed with their mind and they find themselves adjusting their plan and just lighting their soul on fire. All things that we see all the time in competition, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And that has some very obvious and some very stark differences between what happens when you and I walk into our gym to work out and do whatever the workout of the day is, right? I mean, most most people aren't going to pay you $300,000 for pushing really hard on your workout today. It just it is what it is. And unless you give yourself a unnecessarily obnoxious, aggressive time cap, you know, you may have to deal with that as well. So, but for the rest of us, and maybe I'm biased here, and if I am, I'm okay with it. For the rest of us, real life, not competition, thinking about mental toughness and do you have to program workouts that you know are specifically geared towards mental toughness like yeah you can make a grinder but I would make a heck of an argument that real life responsibilities real life people okay not not even you're seeing on a YouTube video with half a million views there's no shortage of mental toughness and discipline required by just regular folks every single day hitting the regular workout of the day in their already jam-packed life. I think the amount of mental toughness required to do that every day does not get the recognition that it deserves. And it may even supersede what we see in competition, which might be a one or two event or even a weekend flash in the pan versus some regular blue-collar worker who does it every darn day of their non-televised life. I, I almost think that is far more mental toughness than what I see in competitions on a regular basis. Um, let's see, so, and, and truth be told, most workouts, I don't know if I want to say they're just as mental as they are physical, but Working out, yeah, it's it's easy to see what happens to your musculature or your cardiovascular endurance and et cetera, et cetera. And, and that's all physical attributes. But I would say the workouts, darn near all workouts, are just as much mentally developing as they are physically developing. And plenty of them are just as mentally tough to actually do and execute as they are physically tough to execute. If something's physically demanding for you, wherever you are in your fitness journey, I don't care what the loading is, don't care what the rep range is, don't care if you scaled or modified everything. If it's physically demanding for you, really tough and taxing, that's not a mental walk in the park for you to make yourself do that. If it's head to toe, physically demanding, it takes mental grit to make that happen. And that's just every day on every workout for most of us. So, uh, where is it? So, mental toughness in the real world for just from everyday people. I hear countless stories, and anybody in these in the linchpin groups hear them every day as well. We've got I can't even count how many members you know up at 5 a.m. to get ready for work. Got to get the kids out the door to go to school. Like your hair's on fire from the moment that you get out of bed. You work all day long, potentially at a job that you don't really enjoy, at a boss that drives you nuts. You come home tired from a commute that was miserable. You take care not of your needs, but all of the other family's needs that you put, and members of your family that you put ahead of yourself. 
And once all of that's done, and all you want to do is sit on the couch and decompress and watch Netflix, you don't. Because you have mental toughness. And you walk out into the garage at 8.15 p.m. and you do the workout. And it doesn't matter if the workout was quote-unquote hard. Everything in your day that led up to you having the discipline to walk out into the garage instead of choosing the easier path and sitting on the couch is a testament to mental toughness. And I would say just as equal as whatever you're seeing in the finale of the games. And instead of just having it in the finale of the games, this person that I spoke about is going to do it Monday and again on Tuesday and again on Wednesday and again every single darn day. That's mental toughness. So getting in workouts, making healthy choices, not choosing to be a sloth and taking, you know, a sedentary life, making the choosing the hard path regardless of the workout, regardless of the complexity of the workout and the loading of the workout. It is a mental toughness. It's a testament to mental toughness and regular folks do it every single day. So I would say most people out there need a more recognition than they get. And and the opposite is quite true. There's so many people in our community that post the workout that they did and you know it's time stamped on the BTWB. Um, you know, when you post your workout on the app, you can put a photo in the back, it's really cool. People share those photos. I see so many people that like finished whatever the workout was at five twenty three AM. That's when they finished the workout, not when they started warming up, not when they got up to have their first cup of coffee. And they do that every blessed day. Not because they want to, not because they enjoy getting up that early, but because they know it's now or never. And if I don't do this and have the mental toughness to do this, I'm just not going to work out because life's too darn busy and I have other responsibilities. That happens all the time. And to me, I'm sure I am biased, that's 100 times more impressive than anything that I see at the games. 100 times. I mean, having somebody that just nobody's ever heard of, there's no media team following them around, they're not getting a push from somebody in the other lane, they're not chasing a leaderboard, they have no sponsors to keep happy, there's no big cash prize. They do it every darn day out of mental toughness and out of discipline. So for all of you regular folks out there, I salute you. And I think that all of you have far more mental toughness by choosing to make health and fitness a priority than most people give yourselves credit for. So Scott, that's a fantastic question. And I don't know if I answered it or not, <laughs> to be honest with you. You know, I guess you say what, what goes into programming workouts that are traps, you know, and I think we've done some shows on that before, but, but that part of the question is quite simply, it's challenging to do, but simple to explain is, is a lot of time a good trap. Obviously somebody doesn't see it coming. And why do you not see it coming? Huge weight, huge rep schemes, huge everything people see coming. Something which is understated, understated maybe in numbers of repetitions, understated potentially in loading, understated because it looks simple and not complex, but all the elements in there compound and hit the athlete in a way that maybe isn't readily apparent when just viewed on paper. And if it's maybe a three round workout instead of a five, that doesn't seem too bad, but then something happens midway through round two and bam, it hits you. You know, all of those things are elements of, of traps as well. And a lot of times it's the ones that don't look that bad on paper because what you're doing is you're giving the athlete an opportunity to express intensity. And if you just bog them down all the time with billions of repetitions and thousands of pounds, yeah, sure, that's a hard workout, don't get me wrong, and there might be a place for that every now and then. But you're usually just murdering somebody's intensity with that, and you're giving a whole lot of uh, reason for people to just stand around and not work, because the loading's so high, the reps are so much, that there has to be a lot of standing around. When you orchestrate something in a way to minimize that, minimize the standing around to keep the athlete moving, then you're on an interesting path that can be a fun path to take people down. So hopefully that uh, helped your question. All right, final most upvoted question from CW CrossFit. Let's see. 
uh, she says that she posted this last week. Um, I thought I would give it another shot. Okay, I finally caught up on the games and it's the first time I watched all of the events and I loved the workouts and the tests. One of the things that gripped me is the programming included a lot of fundamentals of CrossFit which showed uh, any holes the athletes had in their armor. So even if they haven't covered the basics such as dips, wall walks, single unders, kettlebell clean and jerks, they couldn't rely on gaming strategies that would en enable their strengths to win an event. Uh, you know, when they did things such as putting a time cap on the row, etc., etc., having to do something unbroken, uh, so you can't just smash through something with a lot of errors. Do you think this will influence, have an influence on the affiliates getting back to basics with their programming, or do you think they will continue to focus on the popular RX stuff like kipping handstand push-ups and not working through strict uh, progressions, etc., etc.? Interesting question. Um, I guess the most honest answer is that I truly don't have any idea. I don't know um, what will happen in the the greater affiliate community at large. And like everything else, right? Um, the real story is that are there some affiliates out there doing what I would consider some wacky things or some things that maybe aren't the greatest path to progress or things that are chasing what's flashy more than what's effective? Sure, sure there are. But the opposite is also true, which is there's a huge number of fantastic affiliates that get it, that understand it, and they're doing great training for their members, right? But sometimes, you know, you see ones that aren't doing great things and, and that floods social media and it can warp some perspectives and you know it's sad if somebody's had an experience like that it can it can jade them for a long time but getting back to the question um it's interesting there's a larger point in the question that it's interesting how sometimes what happens at the games can influence things and it just because something happens at the games it doesn't mean necessarily that it should influence anything happening at any affiliate period end of the story. It may, right? It's kind of the difference between something being correlated and something being causal. Like it may indicate that something should change, but not necessarily. Just because we see it at the games doesn't mean anything's wrong with what's happening with business as usual at many, many, many affiliates. Um, but people see things that happen at the games and then, and I'm not saying this is you, C.W. Cross. I'm not saying that. This is just things I've experienced in the past, in, in many, many years of doing this. That something will pop up in the games or in a flashy competition that gets a lot of attention, or heaven forbid, a well-known athlete do it. And then all of a sudden, anyone who wasn't doing whatever that particular movement happened to be, or whatever that particular whatever happens to be, is um, you know the armchair uh, programming expert that's like, ah, should have been working this in, should have been doing this, should have been doing that, got a big hole in the game there. It's like, not necessarily. Again, just because you see something in a big competition or even you see a fancy athlete do it, it doesn't mean that you're doing anything wrong and it doesn't mean there's a hole in your training and it doesn't mean you need to modify things. The complex and nuanced response is that it may, but it doesn't necessarily. Just because something which is very popular did it doesn't mean anything other than something very popular did it. So let's say Adrian, for example, this year at the games, he chose to have barbell cycling in 75% of the events. Let's just say that that happens. So every three out of four events involve barbell cycling. Okay, now he didn't, but let's say that he did. What would be happening right now in the greater CrossFit world? An astonishing knee-jerk reaction just because that happened at the games on the biggest stage that that must be what happened in 75 percent of the events so that must be extraordinarily important almost more so than anything else i guarantee that's what i would hear from the entire world and all of a sudden a bunch of people would be doing back the napkin math and saying it happened on three out of every four events at the games, I need to do that in every three out of four training sessions because that's what the games did. I'm going to just 
like a blind sheep, follow right along and not question anything and not look back over my years of training and be like, have I been making great, steady, consistent improvement in all areas? And do my knees, back and shoulders feel good? Oh, they do. Huh. Maybe what I'm doing works really well. Or now if the answer is the opposite, sure, you got some digging to do. But my point being, just because something happens at the games doesn't mean anything other than it happened to happen it happened to occur at the games. Now, the games always offer a very interesting perspective, and anyone, myself included, who's working out in the strength and conditioning space, programs, workouts, the day that you think you have it all figured out and the day that you think what you're doing is just flawless and perfect and can't be modified and it's this finished work sitting under museum glass that is done and, and, and can't have any more improvements, you've got a terrifying situation. So all of us, again, myself included for sure, need to be keeping your eyes open and through an unbiased, emotionless, analytical perspective, you see something happen, that should always be a good reason to stop, take it all in, see was something just flash, was something pageantry, was something done for a crowd experience, whatever it was, what's the underlying uh, thesis behind the programming, does that thesis hold up to rigor and some introspection on it, and if so, and it's found to be valid and useful and beneficial, does that illuminate anything in the individual's programming or process that potentially could be made better? If so, awesome. You know, all of us should always be very open to getting better and finding something like that. Because again, none of us are perfect. All of us could do something better. So if you are lucky enough to actually find something that occurred at the games or something that occurred in whatever, and that goes, oh, I didn't realize that we're not, I don't know, going below parallel enough. Oh, I didn't realize that we should be doing, you know, we're always just touch barbells. Maybe a pair of kettlebells or a pair of dumbbells would be really great, you know, and do the same movements we do with a barbell, but now with something else. Like, there could be some very meaningful things that are gleaned from that. So that, so it has value for that. I feel like I've gotten off uh, base here. But again, the games are an interesting spectacle. I think, you know, hopefully my personal biases which are hopefully derived from just years of trying to observe what I feel works or doesn't work. And that's driven what we do or don't do at Lynchpin. And yeah, I really like the programming this year at the games. And, you know, I certainly, there was a lot of comments filling the feed of like, ah, oh, check out that event. That looks like, you know, that has like a Lynchpin flavor to it and all that. Like, ah, oh, they're running fast and lifting heavy or they got interval things going on here, or hey, they really had to push the pace here, or they didn't unnecessarily load up the athletes here, like whatever it happened to be, like, yeah, cool, of course, that makes me feel good. Um, but I think that's just because, you know, we do, we do, and again, it's, there's not empty words, we really do what's effective, not what's popular. And we've been banging this drum for a long period of time that barbells are fantastic, they're great. We understand the importance of them. We use them all the time. It's also why we respect heavy days. That shows how much we revere and admire and appreciate what the barbell does, is that we don't disrespect a heavy day. We respect them. But at the same time, we realize that a whole lot of people who think they just need to get barbell stronger and that's going to solve all their problems have been lied to or are lying to themselves. And there's so much work to be done on the engine building side of the house. That's why we don't avoid running. We don't avoid sprints. We don't avoid the bike or rower. There's a whole lot of work that most of us need to do on just controlling our body through space, AKA gymnastics movements, and even simple, basic gymnastics movements. Dare I say, they may even seem boring on social media, like strict pull-ups and strict dips are incredibly beneficial and far too easy to neglect. And luckily, you know, we try very hard not to fall into that trap. To give monostructural the attention it deserves, gymnastics the attention it deserves, as well as the barbell work as well. So yeah, we'll continue to, to do what we do. And I, you know, I do hope if potentially 
uh, any affiliate out there, maybe it did help some people realize like, oh, we have been blowing off a bit of strict work. Well, that's cool. That affiliate now has something new to add to their members and their members will tremendously benefit for it. So it's a positive. Okay, good question. All right, let's cover a couple pieces of housekeeping. I'll give a few linchpin shout outs and then we'll be good to go. The couple pieces of housekeeping are, I can't say that this is 100%. So I don't know what percentage I would give to it right now, but it's a high percentage, okay? Pardon me. I'm almost certain that I will be attending the Rogue Invitational this year, which I, I think is, I, once again, going to go down in Texas, so centrally located in the United States. If you're not in the United States, um, it's probably not centrally located, so I apologize for that. But, and I believe it is like, I think it ends the day before Halloween. I think it ends on October 30th, so it's the end of October. And it is my intention on going to the Rogue Invitational. And I haven't purchased tickets yet, so I can't say that's 100%, but as I stand here today, that's my intention. So if anybody from the worldwide linchpin community is going to, they're looking for some place to go, looking for a meetup, looking to meet up with other linchpinners, and you want to go to a really cool, fun event, I would encourage you to go to the Rogue Invitational. And as it gets closer, and I firm that up, I'll let everybody know, and I look forward to seeing as many of you in real life as possible, and it'd be great to hit a workout together. Get a cup of coffee, sit around and talk, and have an absolute blast. So that's my intention, the Rogue Invitational. The next thing is the Linchpin Challenge, 5K Run Challenge, starts tomorrow. You can register today, but it starts tomorrow officially is when you can like log a score. Tomorrow's Friday the 19th, and it goes through Monday. And go to, I uh, posted it in the Instagram story, but you can just, if you're on the BTWB app, which you should be, home screen, upper left-hand corner, hit the three bars in the drop-down menu, hit the chal word challenge, and the challenges page will load, and there's the Lynchpin 5K challenge. Go ahead, sign up, and have a blast. Just do a 5K. You don't need to submit a video. Just post whatever your time is, you versus you. If you want, you can do it for free and just do it for free. Don't pay a dime. You want to get a cool shirt, then pay for the shirt, get it shipped to you, and get an awesome shirt. I've got them over here. Stand by. So, I should have been more prepared. But here's the shirt. I've said this before. The old Linchpin 5K run it says effective, not popular. And then anybody who signs up, to include if you do it for free, you'll get your name on the back of the shirt. Now, if you, if you bought the shirt, you'll get the shirt, but anyone who does it gets their name on the back. So how cool is that? There's a black one, there's a red one, so you can choose either one, and there's a shirt or a women's tank top as well. Boom. Get the linchpin on the back. So it should be pretty awesome. And my goal is to my goal is to do one linchpin challenge a month for funsies with a cool shirt every time. Just to have a fun community event. So you can go ahead and sign up for that. And I think that's it. Let's do the, the shout outs. I've got three pulled up here. The first one is entitled Tim is Strong. Very self-evident. This is from Tim S. On his deadlift day, he got a new one rep deadlift of 455 pounds. It was a seven by one deadlift day. His first lift was at 385. He went up from there, 415, 435, 455, then stepped back down and stayed at 435. But 455 pounds for a single, well done, Tim. Again, respecting the heavy days pays off. Next one I have here is entitled Smart Community. This was just posted the other day and I really I loved it, which is why I took a screenshot of it. Patrick M. posted, oh, this is just probably just from yesterday, because yesterday we did the five rounds for time, 15 kettlebell swings with the heavy bell, the 70 or the 53, and 15 burpees. Great old school workout from Chris Spieler. All, you know, respect and uh, credit for him for that one. We do it all the time at Lynchman. We love it. And Patrick doesn't have a 70-pound kettlebell. He's got two 40-pound kettlebells which, you know, that comes out to 80 pounds for the math aficionados at home. 
And Patrick says, all I have is two 40 pound kettlebells. Should I just do swings with both hands for today? Has anyone ever tried that before? And before I could get in and answer that question, there was a bunch of Lynchpin members that provided answers for him. And they were all awesome and accurate and smart. And it just made me so proud of the, just the baseline level of strength and conditioning intellect in the Lynchpin community. It just, it fills me with pride. So there was a lot of great answers. And then, you know, somebody basically said, you know, you can do double swings. That's a thing for sure. But I would highly recommend doing them as Russian swings if you're going to do that instead of the American swing going overhead, unless you are very secure and confident in your overhead stability with that loading double overhead kettlebells. If not, stick with the Russians for sure. And that was a great response. And that was actually from Ben S. Great response, Ben. And that's exactly i just gave that a big thumbs up i was like right on perfect and that's what patrick did and it went well final one the power of not for time this is from taylor l this is on the running eight by 200 meter run day and taylor said i knew when i woke up this morning that no pr was coming and i dreaded starting but then a little pat sherwood angel which is terrifying landed on my shoulder and whispered don't worry about the clock and that simple truth changed my whole mindset I ran the clock, but I didn't worry about it, and I ran hard, and I was pleasantly surprised with my time. Thanks, Coach. I don't think I would have done that a few years ago. Lynchpin works. So, awesome. Makes me happy. Thanks for all the great questions, everybody. Hopefully, you can go to the Rogue Invitational. Hopefully, I'll be there as well. Hopefully, you enjoy the 5K Challenge. Get yourself a t-shirt. Have a great Thursday, and we'll talk later.